In 1987, Capcom made an arcade fighting game called Street Fighter as a response to Data East's Karate Champ and Konami's ER Kung Fu. It was directed by Takashi Nishiyama, who left Capcom sometime after the game's release to join SNK and help them create a powerful cartridge-based arcade system in 1990 called the Neo Geo. The first game Mr. Nishiyama would work on for the Neo Geo would be a spiritual successor to his original Street Fighter game, and this game will be released in Japan as Garo Legend, The Battle of Destiny, and internationally as Fatal Fury, King of Fighters, in 1991. It involved Terry and Andy Bogard, who enter the King of Fighters tournament with their friend Joe Higashi to avenge the death of their adoptive father Jeff Bogard, who was murdered ten years prior by the tournament's organizer, Geese Howard. This game further evolved Nishiyama's original Street Fighter vision by introducing a lane system for avoiding attacks and having a larger emphasis on the story which he felt was necessary. The game had the unfortunate luck of being released eight months after Capcom released their own Street Fighter successor, Street Fighter II The World Warrior, but Fatal Fury was still a major international hit for SNK, especially in places where the Neo Geo reigned supreme. A line of Fatal Fury sequels would follow throughout the 90s, further refining and improving what the first game did and further progressing the story of the Bogar brothers. This all came to a head in 1995, when SNK would pretty much perfect the mechanics and close out the storyline with the series' fifth game, Real Bout Fatal Fury. As I've just mentioned, an important part of the Fatal Fury series is its overarching story. While not all the games in the series are considered canon, it's still very imperative to what makes the series one of the greatest in all of fighting games. And jumping into the fifth game in the series, I feel I'd be remiss if I didn't at least fill you guys in on the basic story leading up to Real Bout Fatal Fury, especially since Real Bout Fatal Fury is where the story of the series comes to a close. As mentioned earlier, Terry Bogart and his brother Andy enter the King of Fighters tournament with their friend Joe Higashi in Fatal Fury to avenge their father's death. In the canon story, Terry comes out on top as the King of Fighters and wins the tournament, only to be abducted by Geese's henchmen and brought to Geese Tower to fight him to the death in his personal fighting arena on the top floor. Terry manages to defeat Geese by kicking him out of a window and sending him plummeting towards the ground, and Geese dies in a hospital three hours afterward. In Fatal Fury 2, another King of Fighters tournament is held the year after Geese's death, organized by a mysterious man searching for the man who killed Geese. Terry, Andy, and Joe participate in this tournament, along with Andy's girlfriend, Mai Shiranui, and Terry manages to defeat all participants once again. The mysterious organizer then reveals himself to Terry as Wolfgang Krauser, the half-brother of Geese Howard, and challenges Terry to a fight in order to build his legend, though Terry manages to beat Krauser and become the King of Fighters once again. In Fatal Fury 3, Terry hears of a rumor that Geese somehow managed to survive the high-rise fall and faked his death so he could recover in secret and plan his revenge. Meanwhile, Andy, Mai, and Joe hear of the Jin Scrolls, three ancient scrolls that grant immortality to anyone who brings all three together, and they each set out in search of them. The four lone wolves combat various people throughout their journey, including each other, and Terry also learns of the Jin Scrolls after defeating Japanese crime lord Ryuji Yamazaki, who is also after them. Terry eventually finds that Geese truly is still alive, and the two do battle once again at the top of Geese Tower, which goes up in flames as they fight. Terry manages to defeat him once again, and Geese accepts his defeat, though he disappears into the fire to escape from Terry. Terry tries going after Geese, but is interrupted when Hong Kongese businessman Cheng Xinzan arrives in a helicopter and warns him that Yamazaki is very close to collecting all three Jin Scrolls, and they hurry over so Terry can stop him. They duke it out once again, with Terry defeating Yamazaki, but Terry is suddenly transported to Delta Park by Jin Chongshu, so he can defeat Terry and take the scrolls for himself. Terry manages to defeat Chongshu, causing his older brother Jin Chongrei to emerge and fight him, though Terry also manages to defeat Chongrei. And now, we have the game of this review, Real Bout Fatal Fury. Geese is in possession of the scrolls, but he deems them of no use to him and orders them to be destroyed. He also makes arrangements for a third King of Fighters tournament so that he can defeat Terry once and for all and re-establish his dominant rule, setting the stage for this game.
Now I should make it perfectly clear that I'll be reviewing the AES version of Real About Fatal Fury, or more specifically the Wii Virtual Console um, re-release of the AES version, rather than the original arcade version of Real About Fatal Fury. Now, what is an AES, um, you may ask? Well, basically, SNK decided to make a console version of Neo Geo and release it in 1991 as the Neo Geo Advanced Entertainment System. The AES allowed people to truly bring the arcade experience home more than anything that came before it, as, well, the parts inside of it were pretty much the exact same as the Neo Geo arcade boards. And thus, the versions of Neo Geo games play the exact same in their AES versions as their arcade versions, though with the AES versions you usually have the option to select options like difficulty. I want to say for the record that this game will play out um, pretty much the exact same whether you choose the arcade or AES versions, so most of what I say in this video will apply to either depending on which you choose. And thankfully, this and many other Neo Geo titles are very readily available nowadays. Besides the aforementioned Wii Virtual Console re-release, this game has been released to all the current modern platforms, plus a few others, and it's also been included as a part of Fatal Fury Battle Archives Volume 2 for the PlayStation 2 in 2007, and the lackluster Neo Geo Mini in 2018. So, you shouldn't have a hard time um, getting this game and playing it for yourself if you choose to do so. But, with all that out of the way, let's review. Real about Fatal Fury for the Neo Geo. After the iconic Neo Geo intro screen, plus a short but awesome intro screen for this game, you're able to set options for difficulty, level, time limit, language, and also have a menu for reconfiguring controls. This game can be either played by yourself in single player or with a second player in versus matches, like in most fighting games. But as usual, I'll only be covering the single player campaign as I have no one else to record multiplayer footage with. Starting the game, you get an explanation of the controls, which I'll go into detail on in a little bit, and then you get to choose your character, of which there are a total of 16 to choose from, and you also get to choose the first opponent of the said 16 that you'll fight. You're even able to change out characters every time you continue as well. The single player campaign plays out over the course of five stages, with the first four containing a best two out of three match against three different fighters, and with the fifth stage involving a final best two out of three match against Geese Howard. With almost any fighting game, the way to win each fight is to deplete the life gauge of your opponent by inflicting damage upon them through various attacks, while also preventing them from depleting your life gauge through blocking and evasive maneuvers. However, this game is unique from most other fighting games, and especially the other games in the series, because of its ring out system. Each stage has barriers placed at each end that can be broken if it receives enough damage. At that point, should either fighter fall out of bounds, the other fighter will automatically win the round. Not only that, but any broken barriers will remain broken for the rest of the match. You're able to attack with kicks, punches, and throws, but you can also perform special attacks with specific joystick and button combinations to inflict more damage. You also have a power gauge at the bottom that fills up whenever you use a special move, and filling it up to the maximum will allow you to use an S power attack for a short period of time. If you fill up the power gauge a second time during this period, you can unleash an even more devastating P power attack. You're able to avoid opponent attacks by jumping, crouching, or swaying into the front or back lanes, and you're even able to minimize damage from unavoidable attacks by blocking. The A button is for punching, and the B button is for kicking. The C button is for stronger attacks and can be used to pull off stronger versions of certain special attacks. The D button is for swaying into either the front or back lanes in combination with the joystick and even attacking your opponent when they're in a different lane. You can jump by either tapping up on the joystick for a short jump or holding up on the joystick for a large jump. You can crouch by holding down on the joystick. Pushing left and right on the joystick is for moving horizontally and depending on which way your character is facing, you can block by holding the joystick in the opposite direction. Should you lose a match, you'll be given the chance to continue. The AES version gives you four extra credits to continue the game with, though you are given the choice to save your progress if you don't continue. Now that I've covered the basic gameplay, let's take a look at the five stages of the game, plus some noteworthy fighters you'll encounter. First, we've got Sound Beach. The arena is on a wooden dock surrounded by a fence, some stadium lights, plenty of water, and some seaside locations in the background. 
This stage's barriers are wooden fences at each end, which after being broken give way to the edge of the dock, which you can fall off and into the water if you're not careful. Next we have West Subway. The arena is in a center plaza with a large crowd of onlookers cheering in the background. This stage's boundaries are small groups of people at each end, which after being knocked out of the way, give way to the subway tracks. If a subway isn't on the tracks, you'll just fall off the platform and onto the tracks, but if it is there, you can get knocked into the subway, which will then depart with you stuck on it. Next, we have East Side Park. The arena seems to be in the center of an indoor park, which kind of looks more like some sort of mall or museum, with some crowds of people cheering in the back. This stage's boundaries are an information billboard at the left end, and a glass elevator at the right end. Breaking the billboard will give way to the edge of the floor, which you can fall off down to the lower floor. I can't help but imagine that's a pretty far fall, especially since you never see the bottom. Breaking the glass elevator open will allow you to fall into an elevator chamber as it's moving up, though I unfortunately wasn't able to demonstrate it for this review. Then, we have Southtown Bridge. The arena is on some sort of dock with more background crowds and a view of Southtown and its bridge behind them. This stage's boundaries are an array of stacked crates at the left end and a television crew at the right end. Busting the crates will give way to an open shaft of a steamship, which if you fall into will close shut, and the steamship will leave with you stuck inside banging on the shaft door. Knocking the television crew out of the way will cause their equipment to start shorting out, which you can fall onto and get violently electrocuted. Ouch! Not to mention, in the following round, the broken equipment will catch on fire and you can potentially fall onto it and get burned alive. Damn! And finally, we have Geese Tower. Very reminiscent of Geese Tower from the original Fatal Fury, albeit at night rather than during the day. And while not as epic as it was in Fatal Fury 3, with the whole place catching on fire, it's definitely a sweet way to bring things full circle. Not to mention, this is the only stage in the whole game that doesn't have any breakable edge barriers, which is definitely a blessing for the final fight of this game. Not that final fight! All of the characters of Real Bout Fatal Fury have appeared in previous games in the series, so you should at least be somewhat familiar with these guys if you're a fan of the series like I am. On default difficulty, most of the fights go over well if you're experienced in fighting games, but being an SNK game, you should definitely expect to spend quite some time trying to win some fights. Duck King has always been pretty tough to beat, and it's no exception here in Real Bout with his quick speed and amazing kicking skills. He even has his signature somersault attack which is as devastating as ever, and any Street Fighter fans will easily find its striking resemblance to the similar move done by Blanca. Despite the tough challenge, you really can't hate Duck King. His unique rhythmic fighting style, his funky and fresh fashion choice, his dope-ass theme song, and his cute little pet ducklets make him a fighter for the ages. Bottom line, gotta love Duck King. But if there is someone that I have nothing but hate for, it's the aforementioned Ryuji Yamazaki. He's always been a nuisance whenever I encounter him in his various appearances, and it's especially painful here in Real Bout. The dude is crazy powerful. He's able to do a fast jab with crazy long distance and will sometimes deflect projectile attacks which you need to block. But the absolute worst is when he does this one move where he grabs your face, he drags it along the ground while maniacally laughing and tosses your ass into the air. Not only is it painful to witness, but it can instantly KO you if your life gauge is about halfway depleted. Yamazaki is a fucking animal. He'd tear your goddamn head off if this wasn't a Fatal Fury game. game and what would a Fatal Fury game be without Geese Howard's right-hand man, Billy Kane? This British rock guitarist is as feisty as ever with his insane section step and his uncanny ability to make people catch on fire with it. Expect a tough fight with Billy, but you will pull through as long as you keep a good defense and time things right. Though, his defense is pretty impenetrable as it usually is. And of course, we've got the final boss himself, Geese Howard. As mentioned earlier, his fight is a sweet callback to the original Fatal Fury, and not just because of the stage itself. You've got Geese's theme song playing in the background, and the fight against him is quite the challenge. Though surprisingly, it's much more forgiving than the final fights against him in Fatal Fury, and especially Fatal Fury 3. Don't get me wrong, it'll take plenty of tries to both figure out how to defeat him and to actually do it, but you're definitely in for a fairer match in real battle. As to be expected with Neo Geo games, Real Bout Fatal Fury is absolutely stunning in the visuals department. Bright colors with highly detailed characters and stage environments demonstrates this game's great presentation. 
Not to mention, the bright flashes and explosions add to the intensity and excitement of the fast-paced gameplay. What is also to be expected with Neo Geo games is some pretty sweet music and intense sound effects and voice clips, and this game pretty much delivers with those. It's hard to explain in words, so I'll just show you a few clips to demonstrate. <laughs> I think I've made my point. Now, all this talk sounds all fine and dandy, but is this game any good? Well, not only is this game the best in the entire series, besides Real Bout Fatal Fury Special, of course, it's easily one of the greatest fighting games of all time. Right up there with premium titles like Street Fighter Alpha 2 and Tekken 3. And no Tekken fanbase, I haven't played any of the games past Tekken 3. I have no money, kill me. It goes without saying, but this game is fun. The characters move very fluently and the speed is just right. This fast and fluent movement makes it all the more satisfying to successfully chain moves together and absolutely devastate your opponent. The controls also help with this, with the different commands laid out among the four buttons very eloquently. The usage of the D button for lane switching and lane attacking is a particularly great choice, and it pretty much perfects the three lane system that was introduced in Fatal Fury 3. The ring out system is also a very welcome addition, and it's a massive shame that it was changed out in future Fatal Fury games. It brings something unique to an already unique series, and adds a new element to the overall strategy. Not to mention, the various ring out scenarios are very clever and can be pretty funny at times, which helps with the game's already strong personality. I've heard some people say they didn't like the ring out mechanic, but I'm personally all for it. And at the very least, it's much better implemented here than in the Super Smash Bros. game. Ooh, raining thunder at 6 a.m. Honestly, I really only have one issue with Real Bout Fatal Fury, and it's the fact that it's pretty lacking in the character interactions department. Besides the occasional cutscenes featuring Beast Howard, there is a surprising absence of character dialogue in between matches, especially for a Fatal Fury game. It's pretty upsetting coming after Fatal Fury 3, which had the largest emphasis on story in the entire series, plus the fact that this is where the Fatal Fury timeline comes to an end. Nonetheless, this is only a fairly minor complaint, as the game is still loads of absolute fun. Alright, I think I've said about enough. It's time to finish this off and not be silly! Yeah! The goose is loose! Terry hits Geese with a swift triple geyser and Geese is sent off the edge. Terry tries to save him but Geese rejects his merciful act and finally falls to his death. Being the absolute Chad that he is, Terry decides to adopt and raise Geese's son Rock Howard and the credits roll showing the two spending time together and bonding. What a way to end a game. In conclusion, Real Bout Fatal Fury has pretty much all the ingredients of what makes fighting games so much fun, and it is absolutely worthy of being a piece of the grand legacy of SNK's mighty arcade system. If you love fighting games, if you're looking for something a little different in the fighting game genre, or if you're just getting into Neo Geo games, you will absolutely love this game. And as mentioned before, this game is readily available for all the current platforms, plus a few others, so you should be able to check out this Supreme Neo Geo title quite easily. And thus, Real Bout Fatal Fury for the Neo Geo gets an approval from me. I hope you guys enjoyed this video, and I hope to see you guys next time for the next review or whatever new video I decide to put out next. And as always, thank you everybody for watching. I'm Andrew Ambrose, and I'll catch you later.